Hello, everyone. The day is Thursday, October 25th, 2018. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls to be here. It looks like we got a pretty good crowd today. It looks like the message finally got out. Thank the Lord, as Medea would say. So what are we going to talk about? Well, current market conditions, that's pretty much going to be the show in light of everything that's happening. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, just so my ADD doesn't kick in, keep your questions to what's on the slides. And then when we get to the end of the show, I'll open it up for general questions. Or if you find, once you see us on the live charts, feel free to ask about anything. Anything that is requires a lot of thought, I'll cover in upcoming shows. Quick questions, I'll be happy to answer. And then also, if you don't mind, wait until we get to the charts before you start asking about individual stocks. And when you do so, ask about one stock at a time and then hit return. And that's for your benefit, just so I'll know which ones I covered and which ones I haven't. All right, this week's focus is going to be, once again, a bear market update, signs and signals. And I did put a question mark there because longer term, we're still okay. Now, it's, I'd say okay, like certainly nothing to write home about at this juncture, and obviously, and I'll flesh all that out. So I thought, again, it'd be important for us to continue with this line of reason that we talked about last week. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future. Man, a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, in light of the current conditions, if you go to my website as of today, and this banner will go away after the show is over, but you'll notice that I added a free market timing course to the free members of the members area. So all you have to do is put your name, just first name here, and email to get that. Now, once should that banner ad go down or another banner ad go up, then just simply go to members and join for free. And then once there, you can access the market timing course. And I'll pull it up in a few minutes and show you where that is under members. All right. So I guess it was last April or whenever when I talked about this. And I think there was a time even further back in time where I had some things to be concerned about. And the presentation was winter is coming for you who watched who have watched Game of Thrones, which I put off watching for about five years and I finally got around to doing it. It was pretty good actually. Um, I think there's one season left. <laughs> was it just me or did you say, yeah, right, when the dragon's eyes turned blue? Anyway, before I digress too much, that bastard Jon Snow, that's one of his lines that he says quite often, winter is coming. Well, winter may be coming. Now, as I said last week, for those of you who were here last week, just bear with me. I think this is worth going over, especially with the updated charts. As I often say, all major tops or bottoms will have a transitional pattern, a bow tie, a first thrust. Those are the two most common ones or something else. But in general, you're going to nearly always have a bow tie or first thrust or you will have some other sort of transitional pattern. Now, let's talk about market tops because right now it's a little questionable out here, out there. All market tops will have a sell signal. Unfortunately, the reflexive is not always true, and maybe fortunately in some cases. All sell signals won't necessarily become a major market top. However, it pays to pay attention when this occurs. Now, I know I've shown this chart a thousand times, or at least a hundred, but if you're looking at weekly bow tie buys and sells, obviously we had a sell in 00, a buy in 03, a sell in 08, a buy in 09, and then we did have a major sell back in 2050, 2000. 16. Now, by major, I mean off of all-time highs, and for the buy side in something like an index, it you know obviously wouldn't be off of all-time lows, but it would be 
off of at least multi-year lows or ideally decade lows. And you will have some little minor signals in between. But as far as market timing is concerned, our major focus is going to be on the major signals in the weekly bow ties. And we're going to look at the daily bow ties and all and, and drill down in just one second. But we did have that major sell way back in 2015, 16. And then that was followed by a minor buy, a minor buy on a weekly, meaning that it wasn't coming off of major lows. As a general statement, these moving averages, the order of these moving averages, as we'll see in a few minutes, and moving averages daylight in general, or as I now call it, Dave light, and we're going to pick apart that too, will help to keep you on the right side of the market. Pretty simple stuff, and I'll show you something even more simpler. Now, if you go back to that S&P chart, you'll notice that that 2015-16 signal really didn't materialize into the mother of all bear markets. Well, that's okay. And I'm going to jump ahead of myself as I, <laughs> I tend to have a bad habit of doing. But as Greg Morris says, we treat all signals or we take all signals seriously. Now, I'm, Greg's a good friend of mine. I often talk about him. I learn a lot from him. And he's just a blast to hang out with. But he's said before, they treat all signals as if it will become the big one. And what did I just say? All bear markets will begin with the sell signal, okay? But not all signals will signal a bear market. But you have to take each one very, very, very seriously. And again, I'm jumping ahead, but as I often preach, and I've said this ad nauseum, as Greg says, bear markets are devastating, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. You work your whole life. Let's say you got a million dollars in the bank in the market. It, grow, it has grown nicely since 2009, and now you think, you know what? I'm sick of this job. I'm about ready to retire. Well, if the market continues to get whacked and drops about 50%, your million dollars turns into a half a million dollars pretty quickly, okay? So, as he says, whipsaws are frustrating, meaning a false signal in bear markets, but bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration. So, if you get knocked out and lose a little bit of money, and then you end up getting back in, you lost a little net net in the process, you can live with that. But if you lose half of your money or more, as often happens in a bear market, that's going to be a little tougher to live with. Now, as I often point out, even though that last major signal in the weekly bow ties didn't turn into mother of all bear markets, if you look at the weekly signal that we saw in the Russell 2000, from that signal, the market dropped nearly 18%. Now, for what it's worth or whatever, the media defines a bear market as a 20% drop or more. So for all intents and purposes, the Russell 2000 was pretty much in a bear market back in 2015-16. Now, let's look at where we are now in the S&P 500. So if we take a look, we could see that the moving averages on a daily basis, I'm sorry, a weekly basis, have begun to roll over. Now, this is a 10-period simple. This is a 20-period exponential, and this is a 30-period exponential. If you go in and watch the base videos, which I'm going to show you in just one second, for those of you who haven't signed up yet to become a member of DaveLandry.com, you'll see that I have it laid out for you. In fact, I'd lay out a pretty convincing argument, if I say so myself, on why buy and hold doesn't work and why we should all be traders. But if you go in and watch those and just, just get the basics down, you'll see that with an exponential moving average, the day that the close crosses below that average, and the day it close, I'm sorry, the day the close closes below the average, that moving average will turn down. And that's why these exponential moving averages catch up the price much 
quicker. It takes out some of that lag. And if you're wondering why on a 10 period I'm using a simple is because, well, I like to see a true representation of price. And then just completely by accident, 20 something years ago, I discovered that by having that 10 period simple, and I'm using the word period because it could be a 10 period simple on a five minute chart, on an hourly chart, on a daily chart, on a weekly chart, and so on and so forth. Patterns or fractal. And then just an FYI, we covered that in a lot of detail in the last Q&A se session, which I'll have posted to the members area shortly. Anyway, long story endless, when the price crosses below that moving average, the moving average will turn down. And I have figured out or have observed over the years that the relationship between the 10 period simple, 20 period exponential and 30 period exponential can, as you just saw, help to keep you on the market on a major time frame scale and even on a very minor time frame scale. So these moving averages are moving down. It's not the end of the world just yet, okay? But you do want to be prudent. And again, I'm getting ahead of myself. You certainly want to honor your stops on any longs that you might have. And if you are holding on to some sort of longer term 401k or some sort of longer term equities positions, you might want to get ready to get ready should we get some of these long-term signals triggering. Now, if you'll notice this little ribbon down here, the programmers at Metastock have programmed my indicators in, and this would be the bow tie indicators. And I said, look, let's make the trend as long as the 10 is above the 20 and the 20 is above the 30, let's make the trend bullish, okay? If the moving averages are intersecting each other, okay, as you see here and here, okay, as long as the 10 is below the 20 or the 20 is below the 30, then that's going to be neutral. And if the 10 is below the 20 is below the 30, in other words, that's downtrend proper order, that's going to be bearish. But you can see here this last little late run-up we had, the moving averages, the 10 was above the 20 and the 20 was above the 30. 20 is exponential, 30 is exponential. So the ribbon stayed bearish, I'm sorry, bullish throughout that trend. And it's actually still bullish even though price has begun to implode. Well, remember that indicators have lag and if you're going to wait for those indicators to flip over to downtrend proper order, then the trend could go quite a long ways before that actually occurs. So just always remember indicators have lag, and that's why the little simple 10% system, the TFM 10% system, easy for me to say, the TFM 10% system that we're going to look at in a few minutes just uses price, but it also does have a moving average characteristic or a parameter, but we're only looking for price to cross below. We're not looking for some sort of behavior in that moving average. Now, keep in mind that this lag in something like a bow tie, it actually can help to work in your favor. Let's say you're newer to trading and you're taking daily signals and you're not sure whether it's a first thrust or not and you might think you're getting in kind of early on some of these tops on individual basis on a daily chart, what you might want to do is wait for that bow tie to form. That way you have the confirmation. Obviously, the trade-off is you might get in a little later, but the advantage would be that you have more confirmation that the trend has turned. And again, as you can see, these three moving averages are coming together fairly quickly and could cross over on the weekly chart. Obviously, they've already crossed on the daily. Now, let's do an update on the 10% TFM system. And again, we talked a lot about this yesterday in the Q&A. Somebody was looking for the exacts and on the rules. And so I defined the exact rules would be 
if the market is 10% or more away from its 50 week highs on a closing basis and the close is below the 50 week moving average, then you want to exit the market if you're long, longer term. And for slightly more advanced traders, you might want to turn a little bit on the bearish side, maybe look to short overall. So in this particular case, you can see we're less than 10% away on the left side of this red horizontal line that's drawn in here. And to the right of it, we're more than 10% away, okay? So as long as the low of the price bars or greater than that moving average, and you're within 10% on a closing basis of the 50 week high, then that's considered bullish. So ride the trend, stick with the trend. However, when things begin to deteriorate a little bit and the market is greater than 10% away from the 50 week closing high and the close is below the 50 week moving average, you would want to be out of the way. You want to be out of the market's way. Now for the ribbon here, I had them program it, program it in as bullish as long as we're within 10% of the highs, okay? So you can see this horizontal line is 10%, okay? That's gonna be bullish provided, of course, that the lows are greater than the moving average. So you have Dave Light and you're within 10% of those highs. Now, without going into a lot of details, the premise is if a market is here and it's going to go here, and let's say this is down 50%, my pen, I don't have my pen today, so I'm lost. So excuse my bad. Uh, so that's 50%, okay? Well, it's going to drop 10% first, okay? So that's pretty much the premise of the whole system. It's just technical analysis 101. If a market's going to go from A to C and B is somewhere in between, then it's going to go through B first. So B in this case is 10% or more away from its closing high. So again, if you want to look at what the actual ribbon looks like, here's the code for that. And I'll give you this code if you have Metastock. If you were to purchase Metastock, my indicators are in Metastock. Just get the link off my website. Uh, it might be buried now since I put the new members area up. But contact me on that, and I'll be working to get those back up. But if you do get Metastock, I would appreciate if you go through me. I'll make a dollar or two, which I'll toss in the plate or put back into the website free area. Anyway, so that's what it looks like. So we're looking at the highest close for 50 weeks, okay? And what we're doing there is we're taking the current close and we're doing the calculation to figure out if we're more than 10% away from those highs. And that's the math on that. You don't have to worry about the math, though. So where are we now? Well, this is as of this morning. I don't have today's data in just yet. So as of last night's close or yesterday afternoon's close, you can see we're getting pretty close to that 10% level. And it looks like we sort of tagged it back here, okay? So the question is, why was that a sell signal? Well, we weren't below the 50-week moving average, okay? And the 50-week moving average, the reason I have a close below that is that's, a whipsaw filter. Now, as I've said before, as I said before, you've got to be careful when you start adding in a bunch of whipsaw filters. 
you want to make the system as simple as possible and you got to be careful and it's just human nature it's like okay well what if we add in an extra moving average what if we add in this what if we add in that before you know it, it becomes very complex and very curve fitting in nature so if you can keep something extremely simple even if it doesn't print money the chances of it continuing to work is pretty good as opposed to something that you keep adding in more and more and more rules. So keep your rules down to just one or two or three little simple rules. So in this particular case, it's neutral because we did not close below that 50 week moving average. Question is when you say 10% of the market, that particular stock or S&P 500. Okay. If you're using for the stock market, I thought 10% would be a good number. Because based on the volatility of the stock market, 10% is a pretty substantial move. If you were using something like this in biotechnology, you would have to adjust it to the sector or to that individual stock that you're trading. So that number might be much bigger. It might be 20% or more. I mean, some of these crazy biotechs, we get in, move 20% in one afternoon. So that's you would have to figure out what number you're going to use. And I did not necessarily design this to be a system to be used on individual stocks, but I would imagine that it would work. And it works because the way technical analysis works. Again, A, B, C. If you're going from A to C, got to go through B on the way to C. And again, see the market timing course for more on that but yeah I'm sure you can take this and modify it and use it in whatever markets you want now keep in mind always remember that I like to actually look at the charts first and foremost before putting any indicators and 99% of my work or 95% of my work is done without any indicators whatsoever but in cases like this, I do like to come up with something to illustrate how technical analysis works and some parameters, not necessarily to follow mechanically, like we talked about in the Q&A yesterday. Somebody was picking apart, not picking apart, they just wanted extreme clarity. They want to know, is it 10% or 10% or more? Okay, well, I wouldn't split hairs too much on that. But what I would do is say, as a general statement, if a market is around 10% off its highs, then it could be in trouble. That's the only thing I'm trying to prove here. Just like when I when uh, Snap Crap came out, I wanted to come up with a very simple system that would keep you out of Snap Crap should it implode. And it did. And then Blue Apron came out shortly thereafter. So it's like, okay, here we have deja vu all over again where Blue Apron imploded and never would have triggered a simple little moving average system thing. Okay. So I know I'm throwing indicators at you today, but as a general statement, other than the occasional moving average and maybe measuring how far we are from highs, I really don't use indicators at all so as you can see just getting back to this ribbon in here this bullish bearish ribbon you could see that it was bullish for a long period of time it went neutral when the market began to intersect the moving average back here okay when does it go neutral when it intersects the moving average or you go 10 percent or more above 10% or more away, I should say, from all-time highs on a closing basis. So now notice that our little system here, our little red light, green light, has gone to neutral, okay? I guess I should make it go yellow. That'd be kind of cool, little red light, green light, yellow light. And as you can see, we've now closed below. So that's one of the two parameters. Now... If this bar up here gets above 10%, then we have a major sell signal in the works, okay? 
So very important. I know I'm beating a dead horse on this, but it's very important that we pay attention to what's going on in here. Now, as I often say, you can't have a bear market without downside Dave light. The moving average will, the, I'm sorry, the price will cross below the moving average. And the highs will be less than the moving average. That's all downside Dave light is. High less than moving average. That's it. If all you did in your trading was look to go long if the lows were greater than the moving average, and let's just say give yourself, let's say, 10 days. If you're going to trade an individual stock, and I have a little pullback system called Dave Like Pullbacks where we look for like 10 days above the moving average and a pullback to the moving average and look to get in. That's it, okay? If all you did in your trend trading was say, I need 10 days of day light on the upside before I could look to get long, and I need 10 days of day light to the downside before I look to get short, I think you would do pretty good. You certainly wouldn't be emailing me saying, I bought this stock because I thought it was cheap, or I bought this stock because it was headed lower, and I thought I, I thought I could pick the bottom. It looked like a bargain. It would certainly keep you out of a lot of trouble. So as I've showed quite often here, once again, we come back to the 50-week moving average and the indicator on the top. And again, this is built into Metastock now. Metastock 16, I think, is the latest version. It counts the days that the market stays above the moving average, okay? So you could see from 1995, and it probably goes even further back, but if all you did from 1995 to 2000 was pay attention to whether or not this was green or red, for the most for most of that trend, you would have stayed in that bull market. And then, of course, the bear market followed. When it turned red, you would have avoided the bear market or possibly even shorted it. And then the next bull run, we stayed mostly green. The next bear leg, mostly red. And then bull market, a little bit of red in between, okay? That big correction we talked about, well, that's not it right there. It's further up, sorry. But a little bit of a correction you can see here around 2011, 2012. Didn't materialize in anything. And then what happens next? The market goes up for a long, long time. Then there's a little scare we looked at. It's okay to get knocked out. It's okay to get whipsawed. Okay, you don't want to sell on every down day and then buy back back when it goes right back up. You end up chasing your own tail and hating yourself and hating life. But as a general statement, if you have green, you want to be long. And if you have red, you want to be short or certainly out of the way. Now, notice what happened recently. And this chart is as of yesterday. And we're going to zoom in in one second. But that little correction we saw earlier this year. When I started to get my panties in a wad and said, guys, let's pay attention. Notice that when it goes to back to the moving average, the count, and this is just a count, resets. Now, without going into a lot, a lot of details, one thing I've said before is it seems from an empirical standpoint, that's a fancy way of saying it, looking at some charts, when you get to about 100, you enter into a corrective mode. And you might want to pay attention for a potential reversal. I'm not saying rush out and start shorting stocks or sell the form, but say, hey, you know what? We're kind of in thin air here. Maybe I'm going to be a little bit more selective on new positions. Maybe I'm going to make sure I honor my stops on existing positions, and maybe I'm going to take partial profits as they are offered. Not eat like little, like eat like a bird and defecate like an elephant, right? But take a sizable gain when you have a sizable gain as your trading plan suggests. Okay, the question is, air bars below, Dave Light, use weekly chart on 50 MA or daily with 250 MA. It doesn't matter. Um, when I do my longer term market timing like we're doing now, I like to use a weekly chart, okay? Now, that doesn't mean I'm long. I have one leftover long in my portfolio because I haven't gotten stopped out on that particular stock. And I am looking to buy an IPO today. 
I put an order. That's why I was late getting started. I was I forgot to put the order in. I put it in right before the show. But I am being cautious, and I am being very selective, and I am already short a few positions and own some puts because that's what the database is telling me to do, and I'm paying attention to what's going on a daily basis. It helps to know where you are longer term. It's not the end of the world longer term. I hate to use the word hope, but I hope this is just a correction, okay? And if I get stopped out of my charts and the market goes up the next 10 years, I don't care. That's fine, okay? Yes, I'm going to drop some math bombs, all right? But you have to pay, it pays to pay attention. So what Steve is saying is, if you think about it, and this is a trick that I've seen people use before. So let's say you want to know, let's say you're looking at a daily chart, and we could pull up real charts in a little while. And we probably should do that. Let me make a note to do that to make sure we cover that. So 250-day versus 50-day. So what Steve is saying, which is pretty smart, it's a little trick I learned years ago, is if you want to know where a 50-week moving average is, what's 5 times 5? 250. You can put in a 250-day moving average on a daily chart, okay? And that's going to tell you where that 50-week moving average is, okay? Slope of 200 SMA on SPX is down. Yeah, we're going to look at that in a few minutes. Okay. Now, as of last night, this is where we are with Dave Light on a weekly chart. Notice as long as the lows are greater than the moving average. And the easiest way to see Dave Light is draw a line underneath the price bars. And if there's space in between or light, however you want to look at it, then you have upside Dave Light. So you can see back here, we made a little kiss of the moving average. Well, what happened? Well, the count resets itself back to zero. And then, like I said earlier, when you start approaching about 100 or so, somewhere up in there, and again, I was just say, well, what exactly, what exactly will you get the correction? I don't know, but once you get way up here, it's kind of taken away, okay? And that's when, again, you want to be prudent. We came down here, we had the little kiss, okay? And then we started a new uptrend. Now, when we get to the live charts, we'll take another look at this. But I'm just kind of noticing here in this particular chart, it's pretty obvious. You can see that we have a potential double top working, okay, from a bigger picture technical analysis standpoint. I don't directly incorporate, or I should say, let me rewind that. I don't directly trade bigger picture technical analysis patterns. But I do incorporate it into my analysis. So we have a double top. We have a weekly bow tie in the works. We have a potential TFM 10% system in the works. We could start seeing some weekly Dave light. And as somebody's pointing out, we have a negative slope in the 200 SMA. We'll take a look at that in just one second. So you can see here we had a little kiss of the moving average. And then... Now we had another kiss of the moving average. Now remember, this is a 50-week moving average, and this is a weekly chart, okay? Now, as I've said ad nauseum, when I joined the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts, I thought I'd learn all this g -whiz stuff, and I did to some extent. But a lot of things I learned were pretty simple, such as tops are usually a process and not an event. We all think of, oh, my God, the market crashed, the market's crashing. Well, believe it or not, most of the time it's more of a process than an event. The market begins to consolidate and go sideways, chops around, takes off. And as I said a minute ago, and we'll take a look at it once we get to the live charts again. 
But as I said a minute ago, a bit of a double top happening. So it's kind of amazing. You think of a bear market as some like an event. Oh, bear market. There it goes. Oh, crap. But it's more of a process. It's kind of like, oh, well, oh, wait. Well, maybe we're okay. Oh, oh. And I never really thought about it, but maybe from a psychological standpoint, maybe that's how it shakes out because it kind of scares a few people and then it goes back up and then they feel okay. They might get back in and people got scared out, got to get back in. And then maybe some other people get out at break even. And then that kind of churns itself. And then eventually you get the rollover. Now, just a FYI, I think I mentioned this recently. The last time I showed that process type of chart, I thought to myself, that looks like a zigzag. Okay. And this is an actual indicator that's in Metastock called zigzag. Years ago, I played with everything under the sun, okay? And I'm not going to say I'm not going to go back and play with some of these indicators, but for the most part, I try to avoid anything other than like a moving average when it comes to charts. But it is kind of interesting if you plot this zigzag, and this is a 2% zigzag, so the market would have to move at least 2% for it to reverse, and that's what a zigzag looks like. And you can see that it probably would do a pretty good job like anything else, of keeping you on the right side of the market. It's not necessarily an indicator. It just shows you when the market has a 2% or more correction. And it all comes back down to eyeballing the chart. If you didn't know anything about charts, you know, the, what's the old adage that, that I learned from Linda Rasky and that everybody, I said it so much, people started quoting me on it, and then they forgot to quote me, and people started quoting them. But ask a six-year-old kid. Well, ask a six-year-old kid which way this market is headed. OK, or ask a six year old kid, give him a ruler and say, I want you to draw a line and intersect as many bars of price as you can. OK. And then at the end of those bars, at the end of that line, you draw, draw an arrow. Well, that's an uptrend there. And then obviously a downtrend and then some choppy movements in between. So I drew the last lines by hand. But if you wanted the computer to do it for you, that's just a zigzag. Last week, we talked about linear regression on charts, a linear regression line. You could have a market, like I always say, what's the net net price change? Where's the market now? Where's the market a week ago, a month ago, a year ago? Okay, is it relatively unchanged? Then it's going sideways, okay? Well, you can also use linear regression as a trend line to tell you the same thing, but I just like to draw a line, which is equates to linear regression. Anyway, go in and watch last week's Week of Charts, which is on YouTube. Now, last week we talked about a death cross in the works. And notice that price has dropped significantly. Now, last week I said that even if the market stabilizes, the moving average is going to have some interesting behavior because you're actually still adding in some high prices. And that's called the drop-off effect. As I mentioned last week, it's worth looking at moving averages because anything that's well-watched, such as moving averages, is worth watching. And back in my hedge fund days, when I was an advisor for a hedge fund, we used the 30-day moving average as a reference and part of my job was to figure out how the drop-off effect was going to affect the moving average itself. It had nothing to do with the actual act action in the price for that day, but more so what would the moving average do. So that showed me early on that some of these things are well watched, especially moving averages. So we are going to be adding in some lower prices and dropping off some higher prices. But we're also going to add back in some higher prices, too. So that's going to cause that moving average or the moving averages, I should say, to flatten out, especially on a 50-week basis. But you could see what this big slide we had, especially yesterday, this 50-week, I'm sorry, 50-day moving average is coming down pretty quick. But if prices stabilize, this, is, this will flatten out pretty quick because you're actually adding in some higher prices here. Sure, you're adding in lower prices, but you still have higher prices to add back in. So hopefully that makes sense. Go in and watch next week's, let next week's, last week's presentation for more on that. I wish I could watch next week's presentation today and see what happened. 
Um, the death cross, to those who don't know, is just when a 50-day moving average crosses below the 200-day moving average. It's not the end of the world, but everybody gets all excited about it. And it doesn't really test out if you sell on a death cross and you buy on the golden cross. I mean, you'll make a few percent over 30, 40 years, whatever. But, but the magnitude of what happens next is important. So what I'm saying is, let's say you get a death cross, okay, and the market does this, and then you get a buy. Well, if you measure from here to here, it's like, well, that, that signal was flat. You didn't make anything on that signal. Well, the rest of the story is that, well, wait a minute, this market dropped 50% before it gave you a buy signal. So if you do get a sell signal, it's worth paying attention to like any other sell signal. So it's the magnitude. Now, last week we talked about no man's land. And no man's land has become lost because we lost the 200. Last week I talked about Gary Kaltbaum. I said, hey, Gary. You talked about this no man's land when the 50s between the two, when the price is trading between the 50 to 200 moving average. Can you flesh that out a little bit? And basically he says, yeah, it's like the market just kind of chops around when it's between those two. And once you lose that 200 day moving average, then it becomes important. So if we take a look at that, you could see that we were in no man's land last week on the meaning that the market's trading between 250, I'm sorry, yeah, the 200 day moving average and the 50 day moving average. But now the market has dropped below that level, as you can see. So the 200 was holding last week, and then now the 200 has been lost. Nothing magical about the 200. But it can, it can help being the seat, that can be in the keyword in that sentence, help to keep you on the right side of the market. As ugly as it was in February and April, and even May to some extent, the 200 held. The 200 has no longer held, okay? So market conditions have deteriorated a little bit. Okay, third day of downside Dave Light on S&P 200. Yeah, we'll take a look at that. Good. You guys are you guys are smart, awesome, and we'll take a look at the slope in that too. Now, as I often say, when it comes to bear markets or markets that are questionable, my nephew used to say that question. When you when a market becomes questionable, you want to be prudent. Make sure, make darn sure, as I said earlier, as I'll say ad nauseum, that you're using stops on any leftover longs. Now, legally, I can't get into direct trading advice. So everything I do is just for educational purposes only and occasionally for entertainment purposes too. But in the back of my head, because I've heard it said a few times in webinars and all for those who are doing longer term market timing, 401k timing, whatever, in the back of my head, maybe I should come out with a little 401k program or something. Again, for educational purposes only, you know, talk to your advisor and he's going to tell you markets always go up longer term. But then watch the first couple of three videos under the members area and you'll see that that's a farce. OK. But what I'm trying to say here is have a spot where you're going to bail out on your longer term investment. And I guess I should say have a spot where you would contemplate that. Don't say, Dave told me to get out and the market went back up. Dave's an idiot. You know, it's like, no, you're making your own decisions. I'm just trying to help to enlighten you as to what has happened in the past. Market lost 50% of its value in 2000. Market lost 50% of its value in 2008. It might lose 50% of its value again. Okay. Might be in a keyword in that sentence. But as a trend follower, you just follow along, and again, if you start getting signals, you want to take those signals seriously. So you might want to just have a have a chair ready, okay? Know where you're going to get out. 
Now, one thing I was thinking before is what is, is. Don't worry about the math. Before I got started today, let me grab the book to make sure I give the guy credit. I don't know what I did with it. The guy's name is Rolf, R-O-L-F, and he wrote The Art of Thinking Clearly. Here it is. And if you look at the last now column that I wrote, and again, that might be in the members area because that's where the newer columns are being kept. Rolf, Rolf, R-O-L-F, Rolf DeBelli, D-O-B-E-L-L-I. I think it's worth reading. And it's I got a link in my last now column. Um, click on the link and I'll make 75 cents or something, but it's better than poking the eye. At least it'll keep, it'll pay for uh, storage or something on the website. Anyway, he said that our brain is a connection machine and it is, and this is one of those, I wouldn't call it a pure behavioral finance book, but it's pretty close to one. And all of these books, as I said in a now column, they draw heavily on Kennerman and Tversky. I mean, I hope I'm pronouncing the names right. Uh, the guys who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow. And then I also read The Undoing Project recently. I haven't finished The Art of Thinking Clearly, but I'm about 90% there. And I think it's worth reading. A lot of little, little short stories in here. All these books are kind of repetitive in behavioral finance. But the good thing is each story is about a page and a half long or two pages long. So even if it's something you've read before and your eyes start to glaze over, you're going to be in a new chapter pretty quickly. Anyway, he says our brain is a connection machine. Well, it's kind of interesting. I'm a big fan of observation of everything. And we're in the process of selling our house now. We're in the middle of the country. Not everybody wants a country house, as we found out. My wife put us out here because I said I'm going to get an office. She said I'll never see you again. Let me get a guest house. And she doesn't always talk like Jackie Mason. So I work out at a little guest house, a mother-in-law suite, whatever you want to call it, which is a separate structure from the main house. So that's how we ended up out here. Anyway, long story endless, we're looking to sell, and we've had quite a few people come through because they don't know what they want. That's why nobody has bought it yet, and they don't know if they want to live. They want to have horses, but they don't, but they want to live in town, which, you know, <laughs> I want to live in New York City. I want to have a car collection and horses. It's like, oh, that's probably not going to happen in the middle of New York City. And it's probably not going to happen in the middle of the country in Louisiana. It'll happen in the middle of the country in Louisiana. It's not going to happen in New Orleans <laughs> or downtown any city. Anyway, I do have a point. The amount of people that come through the house, they all – I get chat them up a little bit when I'm here. And – with the market beginning to slide, like, they walk into my office like, whoa, what do you do? And this was especially true when I had all the currencies on the wall before I packed them up. <laughs> like, what the hell do you do? Because I've got soundproofing and i got a studio in here and i got soundproofing. And it's just kind of – it's kind of a crazy looking uh, bat cave or mission control or whatever. Anyway, I do have a point. I swear I'm not just filibustering. They're like, what the heck do you do? And I explain to them. And they immediately want to know why the market is going down. And one lady was here the other day. Is it interest rates? It's got to be. It's interest rates. Interest rates. Like, eh, it might be. And I was on Italian television uh, on Monday, and they were like uh, a financial channel over there. And they were like all concerned about interest rates. Well, it doesn't matter. Don't worry what's going on. But – as Mr. Rolf has pointed out, our brains are connection machines. We have to somehow connect the dots. And that's a hard part of markets. You just have to believe in what's going on. And remember that people sell stocks for a variety of reasons, many of which have nothing to do whatsoever with the market. So if some guy is getting divorced and his wife's got a pretty good lawyer, then he's going to lose half his stuff, including half his stocks. So he's going to have to sell those stocks to pay her off. So don't worry about that. Now, if you are the trader type, consider shorting or deep in the money puts. If you look in the in my first book, I should say, Dave Landry on Swing Trading, I did a chapter on in the money puts. If you know options, then... The chapter is almost laughable. 
But if you don't know options, it'll make a lot of sense and help shed some light on trading options. I'm not a big fan of buying options, but I will buy on occasion in the money puts because let's say you're, well, I have GoDaddy puts right now. So let's say you're, but I, I, I think the options people don't like you using actual stocks, but let's call it uh, no daddy, okay? So let's say you have no daddy. No daddy's at 75. And in order to trade 100 shares of no daddy, you would have to put up $7,500. But the options are trading, let's say the options are trading at $6. Well, five of those, that option's worth five bucks at expiration. You're paying $1 for fluff. Well, paying $100 might be worthwhile as opposed to putting up all that margin money, okay? So that's where I'm going with the in-the-money puts. And what my goal is, just in case I get hit by a beer truck, is to have all of this stuff and any other question I could ever imagine, and then I have an ongoing question and answer session to make sure everything else gets answered too, but I want to make sure I can point you exactly to where you need to go to get your questions answered. So within the first week, I think, of being a member, you get Dave Land. I'll unlock Dave Landry on Sweet Trading. So you get that. And then in that, there's that options chapter in there on how to trade deep in the money puts. Now, again, not a huge fan of options. But on the short side, since they often drop much quicker, then they go up, stocks in general tend to fall faster than the put options or a potential option. But anytime you mention the word options, it opens up a can of worms. But So get educated if you decide to do anything there. Now, again, as I said earlier, even if you are knocked out of the market longer term, so what? You can survive frustration, okay? So don't let a whipsaw get you down, should it occur. Greg Morris once said, no benchmark exists for the trend follower who uses cash as an asset class. So what he's referring to is that whipsaw deal. So in 2015-16, I don't know about Greg's models, but I can tell you everything that I follow said get out of the market. In fact, we actually started shorting a lot of banks and such back then. And we did okay. We made a little and then the market went back up. So what? But the point is that the buy and hold people as Judd Dotery over there at Stadium where Greg used to work, but the buy and hold people – look like geniuses because they didn't get out of the way for any one of the market spills since the bottom in 2009. Well, sooner or later, or as I often say, that'll work until it don't. But the point is, over the past several years, the buy and hold people look pretty smart. Well, that could be coming to an end and fast. And that's why Greg was saying that if you are a trend follower, you really don't have a benchmark as long as you're using cash as an asset class. Larry Williams, it is what is. I like that. Don't argue with what is. Amen. And here's that quote I was talking about. I think it's it's got a, a typo or something in it. Active management has underperformed since the lows of 2009, but this is to be expected. Anyone who has kept pace with the market the last few years should be questioned because they likely have not made any moves that would or will predict their portfolio when the next inevitable bear market occurs. And that's Judge Dotery, Stadium Capital Management. That's Greg's old firm. So, yeah, sometimes you got to get out of the way. Here's the members area. Again, you could get – let me just go to a real website, and we'll also get the charts up and running. So if you guys want to start asking about any questions, anything you want, or any individual stocks, um, good good points regarding the market. So let's take a look at those first.
One second. So if you look under the members area and you go over to the free stuff, this is where the market timing course is, just FYI. And then a crash course in my methodology is right here, which covers a lot of the simple techniques, simplified trend following, why buy and hold doesn't work, understanding moving averages, understanding, I mean, if you don't know anything about the market, understanding a bar chart and the open, high, low, close and all that. And if you know all that stuff, just take the quiz and move on. And then down here, I was talking about the now column right here. So if you go here, the books that are recommended in this presentation are listed under that now column. So if you don't mind, just use the links here and go to those. Okay. It would be great if your indicators would also be available on Trade Navigator by Genesis Financial. Thanks for considering my suggestion. Well, what I, say, I don't know anyone. I think years ago I knew somebody over at Trade Navigator, but I don't currently know anyone. And this pretty much, I do know some people at some other brokerages and such, and uh, charting packages. I'm an affiliate for Telechart. I'm an affiliate for Metastock. If you want my stuff in something like Trade Navigator, do me a favor Send them an email and ask them, and I'll be happy to work with them to get it set up. So, yeah, please do that. Shoot me an email. I'll be happy to take a look for you. All right. You're welcome. Okay. Oh, you didn't say thank you yet. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. I'm flattered. That's what I should say. All right, let's take a look real quick at the let's take a look at the major MIGs. Let's take a look at the S&P 500 and let's flesh out a few things that we talked about and then of course move on to individual stock picks. Now, somebody pointed out, you didn't put your name in, so I don't know who you are. So, let's call him Mr. Blank. What was that movie the Usual Suspects, Mr. Blank? Wasn't he one of the characters? that the 200-day moving average has a negative slope. Well, it's you really got to squint your eyes, but I, I hear you, okay? Your bow tie happened in the daily. Your bow tie triggered somewhere in here in the daily. Let's just say right around here or whatever. And then we had a pretty serious lie from that. Today we're getting a little bit of a bounce back. Uh, in old market terms, you'd call that a dead cat bounce. The P to people get all excited when I say a dead cat bounce. The, the cat was dead when he was accidentally dropped. He wasn't thrown on the ground. He was accidentally dropped. It just means that, you know, you get this automatic kind of bounce that happens. And the cat lived a good life. He would do his business in a litter box, and he would walk on the kitchen tables while you were busy at work. And then, you know, you serve your food on those tables. <laughs> Can somebody with a cat explain to me how is that not a problem? Anyway. I digress. But yeah, I could see where that moving average is beginning to roll over a little bit. That's your 200 moving average. Now, somebody was saying earlier, let's get a blank chart. They wonder enough, I looked at the 250 week moving average. So let's take a look at what that looks like. And let's go 250. I'm sorry, 250 day moving average. Okay. So their point was that the 250 day moving average would look like a 50-day moving average on the weekly chart. So let's just see where the 50 would be on a weekly chart. And let's make that a different color. Let's make it orange since we're getting close to Halloween. <laughs> Sounds like my sister's 19-year-old cat. A 19-year-old cat can get on top of the table? <laughs> wow. Must be some cat. All right, let me make sure we got these right moving averages in here. Okay, so this is what we're looking at. So this moving average, this needs to be a simple moving average. So let's edit that. How do you do that? I'll just, 
I got a window somewhere I got to find. That's what happens when you get these multiple windows open. Oh, here we go. So let's make this one simple and then close it. So that's a 250 day. There's a 50 bar and a 250 bar. So let's see if this orange one comes down here to around 2750 when we switch to a weekly chart. So let's go to weekly. And then, yeah, look at that, that orange up here. Okay, so the point he was making, if you look at a daily chart and you want to know where your 50-week moving average is, this is where your 50-week moving average is here, okay? And you can see it still has, believe it or not, a little bit of positive slope in it, okay? <laughs> 250 MA, one air bar. Yeah, we got one uh, one day of uh, Dave Light. There you go, right there. Interesting. Good point. Good observation. You guys are really getting it. Okay. All right, Donald, we'll get to that. I'm actually long that stock, full disclosure. So when we get to these major MIGs, well, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. And we'll go by symbol, I guess. Crap. So we take a look at NASDAQ, whatever. If you want to look at bow ties, we can look at bow ties. You can see recently had a daily bow tie signal in NASDAQ. Pretty serious slide out of that. And then we're having a nice little bounce back today, about 2.5%. I hope we go back to new highs, okay? But I'm bracing for the fact that we might not. Now, your bow tie was way back here. Your trigger was way up here in the Russell 2000, and so far it's been a pretty ugly ride lower for the Rusty, but it's having a nice little 2% bounce today. Now, let's put these longer-term moving averages back in, if I could find them. There you go. That's a 50 and a 200. As you go through these sectors, and we'll just go through the major MIGs, you could see, for instance, in chemicals, we already have a death cross, okay? And you can see that it's getting ugly as you go through these. Energies kind of have melted down as of late, as have the metals, no pun intended. We have a death cross, okay? Now, the death cross signal in and of itself, which would have actually been right in here, is not important. It's the magnitude of what happens below, as I've said before, okay? Death cross and conglomerates, okay? Consumer durables, okay? non-durables. So as you can go through these major MIGs, the major sectors, you can see it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to see that most are in downtrends, most are in trouble, or they're pretty much all in trouble, okay, and headed lower. So that's of concern. Now, you asked why would I be long or looking to get long an IPO? Well, the reason is because sometimes these more speculative issues can trade independently of the overall market. These stocks don't have earnings. They wouldn't know a fundamental if it hit them in the ass. So sometimes they could trade contra to the overall market or just ignore what's happening in the overall market. Donna wants to know about IIIV. I am long this particular stock. And... I would not, even though I'm long, I wouldn't rush out and buy this stock right now. But if you're long like I am, stay long, okay? So I would pass. Unless the stock went on to make new highs, I'd play the next pullback after it does. Okay, a lot of questions coming in. Good job, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Active bunch today. <laughs> now crap bombs. <laughs> crap bombs versus F bombs, huh? CC, CJJD, never heard of it. Uh, well, it's a REIT, and it's kind of thin. China, no, it's retail. China drugstores. Interesting. Yeah, your volume is pretty low on this. Uh, good eye, though. So I would be very careful in trading it because it is a bit of a micro cap. Um, it looks pretty good. You've got a nice, it's coming off a nice major bottom, not a whole lot of bad memories. I'd like to see a little bit more knockout in here, okay? 
But again, I keep coming back to the fact that it's pretty darn thin. And it is a little speculative being a bit of a penny stock. But yeah, it looks pretty good. Good eye, Donald. FedEx. Now, when it comes to shorting stocks, I prefer to short stocks that or let me see if I can show you like an older Landry list in here. Let me go back like a week. Let's just see what we were looking at. What's today? 25th. So let's go back to the 18th. And let's take a look at some of the stocks in here. So I prefer stocks that are at higher levels and just in the early phases of breaking down when it comes to shorting. I also like to short stocks that are big and thick. So I don't have to worry so much about them discovering the cure for cancer or whatever else that might make the stock skyrocket. Okay. And like that's why we shorted GDDY. We shorted INTU. Notice it's coming off of high levels and selling off. And there was one in particular I was looking for. I'm trying to think of what it was. It was something like a big thick stock. Anyway, the point is you don't you want to avoid biotechs. You want to find stocks that are high levels. And if you read the GoGo Nomo, which is under free reports on my website, which I think that link is no longer exists, so you might have to you might have to email me on that until I can get in the free section. Um, but we actually look for stocks that actually, without using the F word, the fundamental word, we actually look for stocks that or big, well-established companies in order to short them. Where was I going with all this? I'd lost my train of thought. Let's see. FDX and CMG. Let's take a look at that again. Yeah, okay. The point was that you want to find stocks that are at higher levels and just begin to break down. This one has already broken down substantially, okay? And it's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. So if you look at... Some of the stocks I have in this list from, let's say, last week, you could see like Intuit. We're short Intuit. It just made all-time highs. It made a thrust down. It did a little retrace, okay? Inverted cup and handle, if you want to call it that. Take a look at the bow ties. It made a bow tie down from all-time highs. So that's the kind of stock you want to look to short. Take a snapshot of this list here, okay? And most all the stocks in this list are shorts. So, for instance, like Verisign, you could see bow tie down, a little bit of a pullback thrust lower. So we could just go through these real quick. And you'll see that everything on the short side, Amazon, is coming off of high levels. Or in this case, it's kind of a, break, a base breakdown, but it is coming off of all-time highs. All-time highs, all-time highs. Costco coming off of all-time highs. CRM coming off of all-time highs. Somebody's actually asking about that one now, right? Um, if you're short, stay short. Wait for the next. See if it takes out new lows and play the next pullback. ePay thrust down a little bit of a pullback. So all of these stocks in here, GoDaddy we just talked about, hubs, are coming off of these major highs. So that's what you want to look for when you're looking to short stocks. Almost all of these are shorts, as you can see. And this was an actual long, it didn't trigger, so we took it off the list. There's another long. That was a long, didn't trigger, we took it off the list. Visa, stock like Visa coming off of higher levels could be in trouble. MasterCard was another one. VRSN, so you got a thrust off all time highs, bow tie off all time highs. So those are the stocks you're looking to short at this juncture. So that's a little quick lesson in what you want to short. CM, CMG, do we cover that one? CMG. So we're still trying to catch that first wave. Now, CMG, much better. Okay, good job on that one. Let's back the chart out a little bit. A couple things. Well, ideally, you want to see it coming off of all-time highs, but it is multi-year highs, okay? So that is kind of interesting. Um I think you can find better. It just kind of drifted lower in here. Again, all these stocks here are coming off of major highs. There's MasterCard. I was looking for that one earlier. See that all-time highs, big thrust low, a little bit of a pullback. 
it could be the case of the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Okay. Uh, Donald, that's on today's. That's a buy for today. Good eye, though. Good job. You, you found it without me. Yeah, but how many times do I find things without you? <laughs> uh, how many things? How many things? Uh, did I say that right? How many th things do I find that you don't find? If you're finding the occasional one, I'm finding. Gold, bow tie up. Yeah, gold's beginning to look a little interesting in here. Let's take a look at GLD. Now, gold's coming off of multi-year lows. Ideally, you want, like, serious, 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 serious lows, like back in 2016. But, you know, we'll give it some credit. It's a commodity. It's kind of wide and loose, okay? So, yeah, we have a bow tie in gold off of major, major lows or fairly major lows. So, yeah, that looks interesting. Uh, if I had to be long or short, I'd be long. It's an ETF, though. Obviously, the HV is pretty low on that. Okay. But, yeah, good eye on that. GRTS. GRTS. This one I like. It looks a little thin. So be careful there. But what you could do is let's let's just for S and G's. Somebody ask what S and G's is. Can somebody from England in here tell them? <laughs> they thought it was something technical like a S and P or something. Let's add a five. All right, hang. Just bear with me a second. I got to find my. It's hard to find a little pop-up window. It pops up someplace new every time. All right, five, and usually on another monitor. Okay, if we add a five-period moving average, one way, there's two ways to get into this particular stock. And again, it's super thin, so you're going to have to do your own analysis, figure out if it's too thin or not. One way would be to wait for it to close above this high and for its low to be above this five period moving average. Look under the IPO section for a lot more on that, okay? But yeah, good eye on that. Again, check the volume. All trading has been above the rising line on SPX from 09 through 16, low extended through today. Okay, I don't fully know what you're saying, but let's see if we could figure that out. All trading has been above the rising SPX from 09 through 16. Well, what about 2015, 2016, okay? So in 2015, 2016, the 200 day moving average was going down and the market traded below it. And remember, we had some sell signals back here, turn into whipsaws, but so what, okay? We're traders. That's what we do. We get out the way. When we avoid the next 50% drop in the market, then we're going to look smart. But, yeah, in the meantime, we might not look like the smartest people ever. So I don't understand what you mean. All trading has been above, oh, 2016. No. I don't see. I don't, can you, can you uh, elaborate on that? Okay. Uh, Dan wants to know about. SQ, that's going to be one of them leverage crazy things, right? SQQQ and also SOX. Okay. First thing you notice, whenever you pull up these short ETFs, what's the first thing you notice? Okay. They go to zero. They all go to zero. So you're thinking, oh, man, I'm just going to buy them. You know, they're so cheap down here. I'm just going to buy them on a flyer. I'm just going to buy them because they're so cheap. And maybe they'll go back to 200. Well, no, they won't, Danny. <laughs> it's not going to happen. What will happen is actually 3,000. So look where they are, 3,000. So all these shorts eventually go to zero. What happens is you get in these things. Well, let's say that, let's say the company is short 
and the market has a 3% sell-off. Well, they got to rush in and short that market the next day or at the end of the day or whatever they, whenever they do their rollovers, 3% lower with all that cash they made. So they keep shorting and shorting and shorting and shorting at lower levels and putting more money in the market because they take all their profits, put it back in the market on the short side. Well, eventually these things go to zero. Well, why has this going to zero? Well, they reverse split it, okay? So you could see split adjusted. It used to be 3,000, and now it's down here. Just for SNGs, almost said it. <laughs> what if we show an adjusted for splits, okay? See, you see what they did? They... Every time it gets real low, they reverse split it. So they will reverse split your pants off on these things, okay? Now, let me go back to regular. Now, this is also an ultra. If you are going to play these ultra shares, what I would recommend you do, not that I recommend day trading, but I was actually looking to to go in and make a day trade on a couple of these recently when the market was gapping one way or the other. Go in and make a day trade on them. Just don't hold longer term because with leverage shares, the tracking is abysmal. And if it's a short share, they're going to have a negative or they're going to have a decay to them. Okay. They tend to, they're going to go longer term, they're going to go down. So if you're buying them, it's a bad idea. Now, the other reason you don't want to hold a leveraged fund longer term is because your stop, let's say you're a triple, you're in a triple leveraged fund where your stop needs to be three points away. So now your risk are three times what they normally would have been. So the leverage washes out with everything if you're being prudent. Now, if you're coming in and playing a little opening gap reversal and you're picking up a little money here and there with a tight stop then knock yourself out. That's a great way when it occurs to pick up a little money. Socks S. I don't know what that is. Okay, that's just, uh, okay, yeah. So this is a three times direction socks. Well, I bet you a million bucks it used to be a lot higher than it was. And that has nothing to do necessarily with that we've been in a bull market. A bull market. Okay, yeah. So this one used to be, what, $10,000. So you kind of get the idea. This is an inverse thing. Yeah, we've been in a bull market, but not a, uh, you know, not a bull market that is what, just ridiculous like this. Okay. Now let's get back to a daily chart on this. So yeah, you could see you had a thrust higher, you had a little pullback in here. So far, so good. But I would encourage you, or I would suggest that you don't hold these things much longer term. You want to get in for a swing, a day trade, ideally swing trade, a little bit more risky. I don't think it's worth it, okay, but knock yourself out. But, yeah, both those are definitely coming off their lows. They look a little interesting. I bet you $100. We got bow ties. Yep, you got bow ties in these things. But just be darn careful. You're not really buying a bargain down here, even though you think you are, because they'll reverse split you to death. I think anyone's been trading a while has accidentally held onto a stinker stock and got reverse split to death. Saying the trend continues, UPIF up if line doesn't break. Trend continues if up line doesn't break. All right, let's take a look at that. He's back on the P's and let's see. Uh, okay, so you're saying there's a trend line uh, in place here. Well, I mean, it's just, you know, you could, depends on how you want to draw it, but yeah, I don't know. Okay, you want to get rid of 2016? I mean, you know, you got to be careful because you start playing fun and games, you know, when you do a lot of these things. Maybe just stick with the 200 day moving average as opposed to trying to draw trend lines. I like to draw my trend lines through the bars, but I think we're we're all coming to the same place. You're saying that, the market has been doing very good for a while, and now it's not uh, doing so good. Month nine, using a monthly nine on TC. Okay, nine. Nine would be nine days. Okay. All right, I see what you, I mean, I can kind of see what you're saying. If we go here, we could draw some 
trend lines. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of interesting. And I hear you. Okay, nine days, that's only, that's two weeks of trading. So, yeah, so far, that trend remains intact. I hear you. I mean, all you would have to do is add in, let's let's just for SGs, let's try that. Let's put that 250-day moving average back in. Well, let's go with a, you know what I played with before? crazy as it sounds a 500 day moving average and we were we were playing around in a break and we wanted to see how long that would keep on the right side of the market let me show you this it's kind of kind of an s and g type of thing and i think we're using a daily chart so what would a 500 day that'd be a 100 day on a um on a weekly So let's say you're using a 500-day moving average. Well, you would have, you actually would have gotten stopped out in 2016. But what's interesting, and what we were doing, we were going like one day at a time just to see what would happen. So let's go back in time. So as you can see, if you went, where would a 500-day, let's just use daylight, the 500-day moving average. As long as you have Dave Light stay long. So you've gotten long back in 2012, stayed long for a long, long time. And then I'd be willing to bet something as simple and silly as that, believe it or not, would have, look at that. So you would have rode that long bear market down. Now, this illustrates what I'm talking about with sell signals in magnitude. So let's say your sell signal was here, or if you wanted to wait for more clean signal was here, okay? Look what the market did from there to there. Let's just measure that for S and G's. Okay, 50% round number. So that's a 50% drop. But if you wait all the way until it gets all the way back up, see, it's only a 15% drop. So that's the that's kind of like the problem with the, the death cross and the golden cross, okay? Thank you so much for all your teaching, Deborah. Oh, you're welcome. Glad to have you aboard, Deborah. Deborah's been giving me a little feedback on the back end, which has been kind of cool. Yeah, no matter how you look at it, I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying that no matter how you look at it, there's, yeah, we're definitely, there's longer term trend lines. There's all kinds of longer term signals that, that but now we're starting to violate some of those longer term bullish things. And, you know, you guys are smart. I mean, you're paying attention. That's cool. So, it, and here's the thing. What, one thing I found with technical analysis, if you're doing trend following, of course, if you're doing some kind of crazy wave counting or Fibonacci or something like that, then, you know, God bless your pointy little head. But if uh, I'm half kidding, if I'm going to get some nasty emails on that. But if you're doing some sort of trend following, you know, we all in the end agree on the trend. You know, we might not be 100 percent in agreement, but we all pretty much agree. But if we're counting waves. You know, as your homework assignment, go out and find 10 wave counters and go out and get 10 wave counts, okay, today for today's markets. Now, a year from now, they're, they're going to give you a perfect wave count. <laughs> Again, I could hear some emails being sent in. Okay. Raymond wants to look at VZ. Can VZ continue to break out over 55? Here's the deal. I have no idea what a stock can or cannot do, Okay. So, I mean, if I knew that for a fact, if I knew it would would hold above 55, then I would, when my house sells, I would put that money into VZ, okay, and just sit in VZ. So we don't know. There's a lot of variables. I mean, who's to say that this VZ CEO, even if Verizon's the best company in company town, let's say he decides to shag his, his uh, secretary and uh, without a permission, of course, or even with her permission, and then she has a remorse, <laughs> then Verizon could tank. So a lot of things could happen in the world. What was that? Was it an SNL or something? Do not come into my office if I'm shagging my secretary. <laughs> but, yeah, so far it's breaking out. I mean, you know, this is a stock that's defying gravity. Um, I don't like it because it's a big fixed stock. The volatility is kind of low. Something bad can always happen with, volatil with low volatility stocks. I'd rather be – it's better the devil, devil you know when it comes to volatility. 
5G and the VZ future. Okay, well, the only problem with that is you're confusing the issue with facts. I'm guessing that 5G is some sort of uh, new phone technology. I think the Chinese have already adopted it. What are we in now, 3G? Bow ties having great. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, just don't confuse the issue with facts. And I hear you, okay? And it makes a lot of sense to, like, say, oh, okay. But, you know, we're connectors. You know, what did I just say a few minutes ago? We're connection machines. Why is the stock going up? Well, it's because of 5G. Well, could be. Could be. But that doesn't necessarily predict the stock will continue higher. I mean, there's so many things can happen. Competition can enter the market. You know, instead of trying to figure out why, just look at what is, is. Is it going up? And yeah, it is so far. Okay. Um, we're nearly out of time. Great bunch today. Great questions. Great observations. There's not a whole lot of great stocks out there, but there was a few good stock picks that came in in spite of the market. All right. If you haven't already done so, please uh, check out the – and it should be – I'm going to try to keep the – Again, I'll keep the sign up on the on the homepage for now. But if you if you don't see it, it should pop up right here. If you don't see this sign up here, then simply go to the members area and you can get for free. Go in there and grab the market timing course, which I gave you a lot of today. But given today's conditions, or should say, given current conditions, very important to watch that market timing course. And also go through those beginner videos as simple as it is. We're going to cover, or I cover a lot of things like the Dave Light, moving averages, and, and all those things that are very important. Simplify trend following techniques that can help you keep you on the right side of the market. All right, let me go ahead and wrap things up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm humbled by your presence. Any unanswered questions, David, Dave, Landry.com. And uh, thank you. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk between now. And then you're welcome, Peter.